Thank you, Brother Ralph. And let me say good evening again to everyone. It's a joy to be able to share with you in these study sessions. I hope that you are learning a lot. Some things are being clarified and some things are being established because I know that not all the information is, is new to everyone. Um, for those for whom it is new, I hope that things are pretty simple for you to understand because we're dealing with some pretty complex and, and difficult topics. I hope as we go through the sessions that you are enlightened, that you are understanding and things are being clarified for you. For those who are already familiar with some of the areas that we have been discussing, I hope that you have even gotten a better understanding. Now, I want to begin again tonight by recapping some of the things that were established last week and also to clarify some of the things that would have been said so to make sure that we are on the same page and that you're not misunderstanding anything that you know, would have said. Um, but we don't want anything to be misrepresented. To just re-establish an important principle which I think we must uh, operate by in, in terms of, of dealing with our customs and our, our traditions or our rituals that we practice within the church. Now, first of all, I want to make it clear that when we were looking at the origin of some of the traditions we have in the church today. And we were not pointing any fingers at the Catholic Church in a way you know, to condemn their practices or their belief systems or their traditions. What we sought to do is identify where some of the customs that we have in the church originated. And the reality and the historical fact is that the bulk of them would have originated with the Catholic Church because that was the established church that, that took over ecclesiastically from the imperial Roman system. And the reality is that a lot of the, the, the traditions, the customs, and rituals that were practiced in the Roman Empire actually came into the church. The intent of the church would have been to sort of Christianize some of those practices and traditions so that you would try to get away from the focus of, of, of paganism and have more of a Christian application. Something which we, we have to be very, very careful of and I'll explain why when I look at what I consider as an important principle which must govern what we do. So we recognize that a lot of the customs originated with Babylon. And we talked about Nimrod. And I want you to, to bear in mind that Nimrod was a real person mentioned in the Bible. Because there are a lot of legends and untruths that are associated with paganism. Meaning that some of the things that the, the citizens would have been taught in Babylon were not the actual truth. But the characters that we're talking about are real characters like Nimrod, who would have been the great grandson of Noah. Samaramis, who would have been his wife, Tammuz, but we do not see. The name Semiramis mentioned in the Bible, but we said that there are other names like Astarte, Ishtar, Astaroth, which are names that have been used to refer to her as a Roman goddess. As well as Nimrod was also referred to as Baal by the Hebrews, and he would be referred to as Ra by the Egyptians. And there are also other names by which he would have been referred to in, in other 
how the culture is. So you're dealing with real persons, but a lot of the things associated with the tradition that they established were not based on truth. For example, Semiramis said that she was the moon goddess. In actual fact, she would not have been moon goddess. And she said that Nimrod was the sun god. That after he, he died, he was raised to, to the sun and he became the sun god. No, those accounts are not actual truth. But what teaches us that there is really one God, the Father of us all, who we believe in, who we worship. But the pagans were poly polytheistic, so they believed in a lot of, of different gods. So what they taught the people were, were, were actual lies, but not the truth. Tammuz was the actual son, yes, of Samaramis, and we read about Tammuz from the book of the video. Mary God was condemning the practice of weeping and mourning for Tammuz. But the tradition that were established surrounded these legends and surrounded these people that these would have been familiar with. So yes, we recognize that these practices are actually part of their traditions and their customs. So Tammuz was supposed to have been a result of a divine conception. He was supposed to have been a result of the body son God impregnating Semiramis. He was supposed to have been born on the 25th of December. That's where the significance of that date would have come from. So in giving worship to Tammuz, who himself be considered as a son deity, Saying that Nimrod, the son of God, would have been his, his father. He was also worshipped as a son of God. And the date which would have been established for that pagan worship was the 25th of December, which came right through a number of cultures and reached right down to Rome, where they had the festival of Saturnalia, which was a festival in honor of the sun deity. And that's why the 25th was the chosen day because it was connected to the worship of Tammuz, who was supposed to have been born on the 25th of December. But it indicated to you that that 25th of December is not anything directly associated with Christ because this festivity or this tradition or this celebration was practiced long before Jesus would have been born. As I indicated, Constantine chose to have that date accepted by the Christians so as to be able to merge paganism with the newfound established religion of, of Christianity. And that's why it was a bit celebrated from that time by Christians, even right into our time. And it indicated that a lot of the practices and traditions associated with the Feast of Saturnalia are some of the same customs and practices that we have today. The giving of gifts, the decoration, the decoration of, of, of the pine tree, the decoration of the homes, the festivity and the eating and the merriment and the revelry and the drinking, all of those things were associated with the Feast of Saturnalia. And we found that some of these same practices were into the church and remain as traditions even right now over time. We said the goddess, who was referred to as Ishtar or Astarte, also had pagan traditions and celebrations associated with her being the Queen Mother of Heaven or the Moon Goddess. And so out of that, we had the Ishtar festival, which has remained with us today as Easter. And we had the fertility cult associated with that, and the whole concept of Easter egg and Easter bunny and all those things that were associated with the fertility cult. And the establishment of the, the worship given at a specific time, that is on the First full moon after 
the, the pagan they establish which was in the full moon after equinox that came down into the Roman system that was established by Constantine again as the day on which Easter will be celebrated first full moon after equinox first Sunday after the first full moon and we recognize that that is why we have it changing of the date of, of what we call Easter. Now, yes, we recognize that there are things that we can connect some of these pagan festivals with. I'm not saying that to recognize the death, the resurrection, or the death, the the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Christ are in themselves pagan. I want to make that clear. I'm not saying it's pagan to recognize the birth of Christ, or pagan to recognize the death of Christ, or pagan to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. I want to understand that clearly. What I'm saying is that there were festivals and rituals associated with these things from way back in the Roman Empire. Coming through the Catholic Church that have reached us on the day. I, I did point out to you that there were traditions and festivals and rituals established by God for the Jewish people in which they practice. One of those early established ones was the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of Passover, which was to commemorate the deliverance of the children of Israel. Israel from Egypt. But there is a lot of purpose in, in what God designs. There, there is no ad hoc or there is no casual, fickle um, practices that are established by God. They have significance. Many of them, of these, these festivals and rituals established for the Jewish people, were just a shadow of something that was to come in a more significant way in the light of Christ. So I pointed out to you. That the feast of the Passover was in actual fact just a shadow of things that were being fulfilled in the life of Christ. So I told you you could check Exodus chapter 12 and see where it was established. And the significant elements of that festival we will see connected in the life of Christ when he actually came into the world. And they were associated with his, his death. So on the Tenth day of the first month, we were to select a spotless lamb, lamb of the first fruit. It was to be without blemish. You see, that's a representative of Christ. He is the Lamb of God, and He is without blemish, no spot, or anything of that nature. Pure lamb. So, that was to be selected on the tenth day, kept until the fourteenth day. And then the lamb is slain in the evening, at the time of the evening oblation that was fulfilled in the life of Christ. His entry into Jerusalem represented the lamb being selected. It was on the 10th day of the first month, and he would have been kept until the 14th day, and when he was crucified. I'm not going to go through the details of it. As I said, in some future time, we could actually give a specific um, detailed examination from all the Gospels in, in the course of how this worked out. So Christ was crucified and he remained in the grave for three days and three nights, actually, as he had indicated, in, in comparison with the length of time that Jonah was in the belly of the earth. And so he was resurrected on a specific day. So he died on a specific day, he was resurrected on a specific day, so in actual fact, there should have been a specific time to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And, and therefore, our celebration should be fixed in accordance with those times, which means then that we should not have been having a movement um, annually of when Good Friday is, when um, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, because they would have been associated with a fixed time. So, 
yes, we can celebrate the, the birth of Christ, but we have to celebrate it in the truth of the celebration. So I will have issues with the 25th of December because that is connected to a pagan day. It has nothing to do with Christ. And we should recognize that even though we might say that we have a justification for it, because we are celebrating the birth of Christ and it has not been stated specifically in the Bible when he was actually born, we know for sure from our teaching that it is associated with a pagan ritual and therefore the church should have found a different day to celebrate and not allow themselves to be um, forced into a, a ritual that had nothing to do with Christ. So that is the issue of that particular day. And then we will say, well, it's, it's a happy time. Um, there's a good spirit to it. Um, a lot of people who might have, have gone unnoticed during the course of the year get some attention. Children get gifts. People are, are, are giving things around this time of the year, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we will have a good rationale for observing it even though it might be connected with paganism. But if I look to you, an important principle is that we have to see precisely how God views particular practice. It's not about us, what we feel about it. That's an important principle which I, I try to establish and I hope we, we get to understand that because we would have seen God spoke specifically to the Jewish people, and I read the passage um, to you um, a little later, which we must take seriously. And, and they were judged for observing these rituals which God would have warned them against. And so for us as Christians, we must take it seriously how God feels about something, and not how we can justify this our feelings about it, or our traditions that we might have established that may seem comfortable for us. It's very important that we understand that. I drew the reference to the Jews giving worship to the golden calf, which they would have made following a pagan um, practice and tradition which came from Babylon into Egypt, which they would observe, and, and they were now laying hold of. But they said, well, hey, this golden calf represents Yahweh, our God. So we are really giving worship to, to our God in the form of this bull. That's wrong because it is going to go contrary to what God expects of them. And the reality is that they were punished for it because they, they went contrary to what God indicated. We have another example in the book of First Samuel, where Saul was told when he went up against the Amalekites, he was told to destroy all the animals and the people and everything. Don't, don't keep anything at all. That was the instruction that Samuel would have given to Saul. Now Saul listened to the people who told him. We can keep some of the sheep, the best of them, and we can offer them as a sacrifice to God. Good reason, good rationale. But what is going to happen here is that they're going to be disobeying a, a, an instruction given by God. See, this is the important thing. Watch what God instructs, what for what God expects, and we follow that. So he kept the sheep, offered a sacrifice, and then when Samuel approached him to give a comfortability, he said, Saul, did you do what God commanded? He said, yes, they did that. Saul uh, and Samuel asked, but how come I am hearing the beating of sheep? His response was, the people said that we will be able to keep the sheep and offer them as a sacrifice to God. The response was, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. 
even though they were they offering what they would consider a justifiable reason why they are doing something that goes contrary to an instruction that God gave, but the soul ended up being separated from the spirit and the presence of God because of his disobedience. So the point I'm making here is you've got to look for what God says and we obey what God says. If God tells us not to follow the traditions and the practices of the pagans because they are an abomination to him, and he is not pleased with offering worship to him in that form, then we must take that very seriously despite how we feel about it or how universal or commonplace the practice is. That is very, very significant. And, and that's a, a principle we must definitely hold to. Because it's very much connected to how God views our worship to Him. And it's not what we feel comfortable with or what pleases us, but it is it's what pleases God. So in light of that, we examine what we do. So we examine what we do, what we call Easter. We examine what we do, what we call Christmas. Because these are terms that were given to traditions and festivals that were not initiated by the first century church. They were not commanded um, to be observed by God in these ways. And therefore, we must pay careful attention to that. Now, I also indicated that when, when there were kings that were righteous and served God, they made sure that as much as possible, they tried to get rid of, of all the images, and all the things and, and rituals and practices that represented paganism. There's a verse I want to read to you from the book of Deuteronomy. And this is instruction which is given by God. From the first verse, just... Three verses. Deuteronomy chapter 12 says, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars, and break down their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. And you shall hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of that place. So completely rid yourself of any semblance of images or practices that these pagans observe. Don't try to Christianize them. Don't, 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 don't try to, to purify their altars. Offering sacrifices to me on their altars. Get rid of their altars. Get rid of their images. Get rid of their groves. Destroy everything that brings any remembrance of their practices because I'm giving you different practices and different instructions which you must follow. We go back to when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple where their God was worshipped. That's their God. What happened? The image was thrown down. They put it back up. And subsequent to that, the image was thrown down again. And it was broken into pieces. What that was saying is that God does not accept himself being worshipped along a pagan deity. Don't put me in the same temple as your pagan god. Don't worship me alongside of, of paganism by just giving a different name to the practice or having a different rationale for the practice. Just follow the instructions which I give. So in, in that light, I was pointing out how, how serious it is, it is that we, we try as much as possible to avoid any resemblance of paganism. Now, today in our world, there, there is a, a, a sort of 
elongated structure called an obelisk. It's called O B E L I S K. We have many of them around the world. That, that came from the pagan tradition of offering some worship. And it came way back from the Babylon. Because remember, the Tower of Babel was built by Nimrod. And this, and this tall structure, some of them are over or close to 500 feet in height. And we have them in a lot of different countries in the world. And if you look at the, the monument, the Washington Monument, that is an example of an obelisk. And then there is also one in the Vatican in, in St. Peter's Square. Now, these are images which were used to represent pagan worship and pagan practices, but they're still part of our, our society. And you ask, why are they there? They will be objects, are they be symbols that are connected to paganism. And if God says destroy them and don't have any of these images around, it means that it would be an affront to God for a church to still have you know, the pagan world and, and have them. Have them in Egypt, have them in, in, in the United States, a lot of parts of the US, we have them in Ireland, we have them in, in, in Britain. But for, for those to be in a, a place where you are saying you're giving worship um, to God, that again would be a, a symbol of paganism, which God would be the so yes, we have a number of, of practices. I identify them, and I'm not going to go back to all of them again. I wanted to make the point that I'm not saying it's pagan to recognize Christ's death, Christ's birth, and Christ's resurrection. But we've got to be careful that we don't embrace paganism, pagan traditions and practices while we are saying that we are honoring God in these things. Because what God has told us is to stay far from the practices Customs and traditions of the pagans, because he said, because they are being. And my aim, as I said, was not to ridicule um, Roman Catholics, but to point out that a lot of the traditions that we have have come to the Roman Catholic Church. So it, was not, it was not a matter of being balanced, it was dealing with the reality and the truth. And these practices came to the Roman Catholic Church, and many of them still remain in our churches today. Some of the practices that are associated with two of our main um, terms of celebration, which we call Christmas and which we call Easter, have been things that were, were practiced during the, these, these times of, of paganism. Even the fasting that was connected to paganism, you know, we will say we will have a good reason for the length because Jesus was in the desert fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So again, we will have a good rationale for saying that this is where we will observe Lent. But the reality is that that period of mourning, which is referred to as Lent, was practiced even before Jesus came into the world to even go into the desert for the fast 40 days and 40 nights. That was something that was observed. So we have to watch these customs, see where the origins are, and, and rather than trying to Christianize them or justify them because we can find a parallel for them in, in, in Christian belief, we, we cannot associate these things with what should be our practice in worship for God because we recognize that they have paganism associated, associated with them. Even the practice of not eating any meat was, was practiced in that time when they were observing their, their period of four days of, of fasting. So I hope that that has been made clear, that we accept that we can commemorate the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. But we avoid any pagan connections in terms of the worship that we, we give to God. And so we have to be careful that we don't get entrapped Sneered in these things. All right, so that I hope has been very clear. But we want to pick up what we're going to be examining tonight, and that is 
we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God. A rev, Reverend Jack Moore. Yes. Just yes, before sir. you just before you move to that, I think um Richard Percival, he had a yes. question, but he had his hand raised, so I'm not sure if it's a question or a okay. Comment. So Richard. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night to you. Yes, sir. Um, question um uh, for you. You mentioned earlier about um traditions. Yeah. Um do you think that things have changed over the years? Okay. Um there's one classic one that I, I look at a lot. Where where a time where in the Bible where a young lady will wear or uh, ankle punchy foot that uh, represent a particular type of a lady. But to today that don't mean that. Today it just is is style. Yeah. No, no. What 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 it's wrong for a uh, or for it be a same or for a Christian young lady to wear that anchor bracelet on she foot because of 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 the tradition says four hundred years ago it mean one thing and she that that would clash it as that but today it don't now what I say as I say this is that let me look at Christmas where some people may use the day for the the concept of families coming together because it's a bank holiday. There's no work. Families coming together and have a social gathering before the fanfare of the lights and that we just come together and have that social gathering because it's a bank holiday. Would that be wrong to, to say that Christians are celebrating a, a pagan festival? Now, remember what I said earlier, Richard. We have to identify what were the, the specific things that were practiced on the paganism and, and watch those carefully. All right? We have to watch things that God and then and be careful that we do not practice the same things that God condemns. Well, you mentioned if we part with the anchor and whatnot, we, we are not dealing with a, a specific instruction that was given by God telling you that you should wear a, 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 um, an anchor. We're not, we're not dealing with that. So that, that's a, a custom that was established by man. And, and so people will, will have diverse opinions on how they, how they view those things. What, I, what I'm dealing with are things that God specifically told the children of Israel not to observe, and they broke those things, the traditions, and they observed things that God told them not to observe. That's where the issue is. I'm right, saying, yeah, yeah. Right, hold on, hold on. Right, going back to Christmas. Yes, no. You you can you can do things that you will say yes are family oriented. No problem with that. But what I'm saying is, you have got to ask yourself now: Are there other things that you do? That are connected with a pagan practice. I'm, I'm saying having a family get together and eating is, is not a, a, a tradition tradition that is necessarily pagan. But you you decorate Christmas trees and and you, you spend billions of dollars on Christmas trees annually. You spend billions of dollars on alcohol because these were things that were associated with that festival and you get engaged in those things. And then you commemorate you are commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ on the 25th of December, which we know was connected to a pagan day. That is where the issue comes. Right? You, you, you're dealing with the pagan aspects of what you are doing that you must give consideration to. I don't think it is pagan if you have a family get together, if you give gifts. But all I'm saying is that why do we only focus on these things at that particular time of year? You still have to watch how you are controlled. So people have needs all through the year before Christmas. So there are other times that you can get together and have um, family activity. Okay? It, it is, a, it is a there a time that, that young children might need gifts? As we, we often say, that it's a good thing because children get a lot of gifts at Christmas. So we find a, a rationale for it. 
But what I'm saying is just watch those elements that are connected to paganism and avoid those practices and what you consider as giving worship to Jesus. Okay. I I I understand that's the, my, that's the my point. Right. I get you and I understand that. I understand right. that that for Christians on the their question is that there are certain things within the 23rd of December that are paganistic and right. should not practice. Okay. But also look at how how we 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 are oh yeah looking at it. No. Basically we, we have two or three days of back holler place shut down because of Christmas. Let me say it's a Christmas. We celebrated but the world celebrate the world is celebrating this day as their day thing. So cannot the Christians use that day to bring themselves together without the without the um let's say the lights decorated the tree and that whole whole paganistic behavior can we not do something for ourselves because because there's a battle pajama and and you, you get a lot of deals shot you you get a lot of deals for for, for that day around that same festival time and i'm saying that that, that I, I don't know all right, for sure, but don't, 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 don't confuse yourself too much about that. No, I mean, confuse myself. I understand it because there are some serious questions that our people are asking today. They may not have. Remember, a lot of people don't ask these things, but they, they get in the corners and they discuss these things. So I'm saying, because everybody's not bold like me and question certain things, but I'm saying that, that hope people are looking at it. Yes, that, that, that is true, that, that, that people, you know, are afraid to express um, their, their feelings about, about things and, you know, they don't come out openly and express things, but understand the point they're making. We have found ourselves, well, sort of entrapped in a tradition that was established from a pagan origin that was never, it's definitely on the standards point I'm making that was never established by Christ nor in the first century church. Christ never told us to celebrate his birth. And it was not celebrated in the first century church. Simply because birthday celebrations really came again from out of other cultures other than, 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 than the Judaistic um, tradition. That was not part of their tradition. All right. The 25th of December, we now have the pagan connections. A different day could have been chosen. The reality is, and we say that, yes, Christ was born. As they indicated, if we really check the Bible carefully, we will get a better time period, not even an exact date, but a time period. If we read really look, we could uh, study it carefully, we could understand when Christ was born. This is a study that could also be done at a later date, because these are things that we can, we can see and we can examine. So we could have chosen, even if we want to celebrate, a different time. But we've, we've been caught in a tradition and a culture which has connected paganism and has become global and worldwide. But that does not mean that Christ accepts it. That does not mean that that, that God accepts it. Easter is, is also worldwide. And we've got the Easter bunny. Yes, yes, yes. we yes, yes. got all those things. So so what I'm saying is, is that we, we need not feel that these things are all right because they are, are common. I know you still talk about deals associated with Christmas. Don't don't get ourselves trapped in in, in the in the whole activity, festivity, and and, and commercial aspect of of of, 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 the, of the of the season. As I say, watch for what we are doing. We must always ask ourselves, why am I doing what I am I am doing? Why am I celebrating on twenty fifth of December? Why am I decorating a Christmas tree? Why am I doing X Y Z? Because you you have, should have a, a, a sound reason why you are doing what you are doing. So, so these are things that we must examine. So, we, we want to move off of that because then we can okay. say, okay, one, one, one last question. So, you yes. mentioned earlier um, 
in your last thought here about celebrating the birth of Jesus, is that yes. again? Is that again a, a tradition that we, we hold to and, and that are not spiritual? Because why? Why say that? A lot of the, a lot of our song that is sung in church are connected to the same um birth birth of Christ. Yes, but but Richard, I just say that I don't think it is pagan to celebrate the birth of Christ. It is just not it, that we we were instructed to do it. We we get caught up with a tradition, but it is not right, necessary right. that it is it is wrong to commemorate. The birth of Christ, but we get trapped in the tradition. For example, we don't. Do you see anybody saying um, when they survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, and years they spent in vanity and pride at Calvary uh, on on the Christmas season? But why not? Because Jesus is no longer a babe. Jesus became an adult. He died and he rose. So, so much of what we should be saying about and preaching about is the death and resurrection of Christ, not Christ as a being. So we get trapped in tradition that we don't even sing any songs about, about Christ's resurrection and, and his death at Christmas. You see, that's how tradition sort of traps us and it's weird. <laughs> yeah. See, the tradition picks the word a season out of season. So you see, so, 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 we can get, we can get uh, uh, the traditions. If I mean, you you're, you're right. Christmas Carol, for example, if you want to say a Christmas carol, Oil to Bethlehem or or joy to the world in April. People will look up at you and wonder what's what going on in your head. You see? Yeah. Because you <laughs> see what I'm saying? We get yeah, because this week at work, right? This week at work, I'm um, saying it is well. I say some songs that if you know any person, when you say church, when you say all uh, fruit of songs, I say, but these not these not really fruit of songs. Because I said this so that people sing our funerals, but they're not primarily a for song. And they, they get laugh at me. And even the same song with Jolty Word of Ross them, freak to me at Christmas yet. So I, I, I understand that whole concept of it because of All right. again tradition. We, we, we do certain things and sometimes we don't even know what we're doing them. So I, I understand okay. that. Right. So that that's what I'm saying. As as Christians, we have to be careful. That we don't get ensnared and entrapped by the way the world does things. See, because we are different, we are called um, to a, a different practice, and we must recognize that we operate based on what God's instructions are, and what God's feelings are about issues, about things connected to our worship, and that's what must be foremost in our mind. That's that's what I'm making, it. and that's what I want to establish as as an important principle. And we will move on. We will move on from there. So, okay, so right. We, right, we give thought for, for what God thinks and what God feels about things and not just a tradition that satisfies our emotion or our feeling or because the world is engaged in it. Yeah, right. Okay. We have two, two more questions come in. One from um, Jenny. And, and then the second one is from Mavis. So, Jenny, you can go ahead. And then Mavis. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening. I don't know if it's a question really, but my understanding of Christmas is and, and celebration on the twenty fifth is that the the poor Julius um, announced that they will celebrate this um, Christmas uh, Christ's birthday on the twenty fifth, so mm -hmm. that they will come back the pagan festival of worshiping the sun god uh, because of the disorder and immorality that was going on so my understanding is that the it was to combat that it was to replace that so that's 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 what i have to say all right uh, e e even even if that was it but i don't think that it was to combat that but that is the rationale that could be given that Romans are celebrating Saturnalia on the 25th. They are having their own pagan festival, et cetera, et cetera, in worship of a sun deity. We will do the same to our, our, our Jesus. But remember, they were celebrating the 25th. And every time you celebrate on the 25th, you are commemorating a pagan date which was set for their God. 
So even if you want to combat that, you can't be doing it in alignment with the same time they are they are celebrating because that goes back to what I said when the, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant in their temple and God threw it down. Don't bring me alongside of, 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 of their God. He's a pagan deity. I'm not to be worshipped alongside of him. So I didn't say we, we can't sort of Christianize the day and the activity by doing the same thing that they do it and say, well, we want to cut out. Because the, the, the reality is, is that that spirit became so prevalent, as I told you, that in the, in, the, in the early Puritan church, they had to ban Christmas. It was even banned in the United States in the, in the early um, um, Christian era because, again, of the drunkenness and the reverie and the partying and the lascivious behavior that was associated with it. So you didn't Christianize it. What happened is that even church folk got wrapped up and tangled in the same practices and it had to be banned. So that's why you must look at that. There's a spirit that's connected to these things. And so we, 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 we also must recognize that we, we've got to give um, important consideration to what we are honoring. So every time you celebrate on the 25th of December, you, can't, you cannot be celebrating Christ because he was not born on that day. And, you, and we often say we know he was not born on that day. So therefore, don't attach any significance to that day. That's my position. Don't attach any significance to the 25th of December because it does not apply to God. I don't think, based on what the word of God says, that God will accept that as, 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 a, as a justifiable reason because we can celebrate another day and another time which should have been even more appropriate than the heart of winter when the shepherds were not there on the hills. So the whole story and the account shows us that it could not have been on that day. So we should distance ourselves from it. And that's the best practice to me as a Christian. And in the light of how God used these practices, to me, the best practice would have been not to, to, to make that day an important day for us in our Christian calendar because of the origin of it. That, that, that is how we feel about it. It will not be the best practice in the level of what we see coming from the word of God. All right, Mavis, um, are you? Good night. Good night. Well, um, a question or a statement. Well, um, for the birth of Christ, he was given gifts. Gifts was brought to him. Hmm. And it was a celebration. Yes. Yes. Right. And I try to understand what you were saying about Christmas, right? We know that we cannot say that Christ was born on Christmas Day because we don't know. Right. But at the end, we are still going to celebrate his birth, even if we celebrate Christ's birth in April. Yeah. Someone, uh, somewhere. Uh, Someone somewhere will still say it's pagan because someone somewhere will say we don't know that it's his birthday, so we should not celebrate it that day. But for me, the point is he was born. I understand what you are saying, but as Christians, we still have to celebrate the birth of Christ. We still have to celebrate the death of Christ and his resurrection. So, how are we going to celebrate his death if we don't celebrate his birth? Now, now notice what you're saying. Notice what you're saying. You said we, we have to celebrate his birth. Do we, do we have to? Were we told to? Now, we, we have instruction from the word. In, in, in relation to celebrating the, the communion, you just said as much as you um, observe this, you do this in remembrance of me. We have instructions from the, the, the word about celebrating the, 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 the death and resurrection of Christ because they are, they are significant to what we, we teach in relation to the Christian practice. Remember, there was no instruction to celebrate Christmas and ask yourself the question, why did the first century church, the church that Jesus established with his disciples, they did not celebrate 
Christmas. Christmas came about three, four hundred years after when it was introduced into the church by by the, the whole um con in the whole Constantine era. So don't say the after because it was not celebrated prior to that time. So it's not a after, is that we have established a tradition connected with it. And as I said, I'm not saying it is pagan to, to, to celebrate the birth of Jesus, but we don't have to celebrate. We will not be violating any godly mandate if we did not celebrate the, the birth of Christ. Because even as, as I said, we recognize Christ is no longer a babe. Christ grew up and, and he came for the purpose of giving himself for us. He rose on eternity to justify the fact that he is God because he can lay down his life and take it back up. Those are the things that the church emphasized. And if you read all through the book of Acts, you will see that they emphasize the death and the resurrection of Jesus. There was no emphasis on the birth. There was no celebration of the birth because the significant um, aspects of Christ's life in Christendom was his death and his resurrection. Not that, as I'm saying, that we are, we, we, we would anger God or we would violate any um, moral principle because we, we commemorate the birth of Jesus. But the, the, the real truth of it is that it's the death and resurrection that we proclaim as the gospel. And we do not talk about the birth of Christ all through the year. We, we talk about the birth of Christ only at December. But all through the year, we are speaking about the, the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. That is what is significant, and that's what we should emphasize and, and not be, be, be carried away by the whole sentiment that is associated with the Christmas and, and the giving of gifts. As I say, yes, we, we would align ourselves with the good aspect of that because the wise men brought gifts to Jesus. But those gifts that were brought were again symbolic and significant. Gold, myrrh, and frankincense. They had a purpose and they had a connection to Christ. We don't, we don't, we don't want to go into the details of that, but that was the, the reason for that. Also remember that at the Saturnalia festi festivity, gift giving was the popular thing. That was a practice then. So that's what really it is associated with. See, so don't, don't let us get carried away the fact of the, the, the good aspects that we can see in something. We have to recognize the origin of it and how God feels about pagan origins and how we should relate and, re, and react to them. That, that is the critical part of the, the whole um, thought pattern that we should have in relation to this. And Rev, just three um, quick comments from the chat. Someone is saying, uh, actually, Sophia Holder is saying, just sharing an observation from the word regarding the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And then yes. we have a comment from um, Sandra Pollard Bostic. And she's saying, seem to me that maybe we, the Church of God, should look at these practices. Uh, that's from Sandra Pollard Bostic. And then I'm not too sure who's the galaxy j7 but the, the person is saying um if so christmas and easter are so-called pagan festivals then we should find out for ourselves if we should continue to participate in them so similar to the thought expressed by sandra pollard bostick to really um, explore them in more depth and then pastor carrington is saying it is, it is impossible for us to accept the birth of Christ without the need to celebrate it. Wait, it's, no, it's a question. Is it possible? No, I suspect it because it's, it's a question, but he has, is it impossible? I suspect what he wants to say, is it possible for us to accept the birth of Christ without the need to celebrate it? If we did not, would we lose our salvation would, be, would we be lesser Christians for doing so? So there seem to be three questions there uh, from Pastor Carton. And uh, I suppose you can probably um, tidy up on the others um, or comments and, and suggestions, really. But this seemed to be, um, is it possible for us, for us to accept the birth of Christ without the need to celebrate it? And then if we did not, would we lose our salvation? 
and would we be lesser Christians for doing so? All right. Um, I, I, I go to Pastor Carrington's comment first because that's that's the last one. No, we will not be. You will not be less of, of a Christian because we do not have any instruction that we should. So we are not in disobedience to the word of God. We are not contravening any um, expectation that God has on us. That, that's, that's the way we answer that. And the, the person who would have mentioned that the, the last the supper, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, yes. So he specifically told us to do that in remembrance of him. He never told us to observe um, Christmas in remembrance of him. These, these are things that we have to take in consideration and bear in mind when we, when we are, are engaged in things so that we understand what we do and what we do. And, and to, to the followers concerned, yes, we, we, we need really to examine what we do and why we do it. Should a church be involved in the Easter egg hunt? No, because we know the Easter egg hunt is connected to the bigger ritual of hunting for the for the, for the, for the egg that Samaramis was supposed to have um, come down in. But remember, I told you that a lot of lies were associated with, with legends because the Bible makes it clear that Satan is the author of lies. So don't think for one minute I'm telling you that some of these things were true. These, these were legends. The people themselves were real, but the, the things they taught their people were lies. And so they got worship surrounding these things. So we should not be involved in, in this whole thing with the Easter egg and the Easter bunny and the Easter bunny, because those are things associated with Easter. But 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 we, we are not celebrating Easter. When we celebrate, we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And that's why I say to my, my folk at church, do not come to church on that morning and say we are celebrating Easter. We are not celebrating Easter. Easter is a festival that had its origin in paganism. We are celebrating, we are celebrating the, the resurrection of Christ. We are celebrating the crucifixion of Jesus, even though we might debate whether it was Good Friday or whether it was a day higher in the week. And as I said, that can be proven from the Bible. The tradition of Good Friday was established by the Catholic Church and the Monday, Thursday thing was part of that tradition. But you can be shown precisely, and I mean in detail, because the Bible is very specific of when Jesus was actually crucified. Now, there are some things that we associate. Now, I am going through this now because we got time. And so even if we don't get the kingdom of God, we, we have time. As I told you, I'm not rushed. I am going to stay with you until we finish the whole of this study. So, so if you have questions and you have concerns, ask them. I will discuss them with you because I want you to understand where I'm coming from, understand the Bible. So, go, so go back to the, the, the tradition that was established. On the 10th day of the month was the selection of the Lamb. As I told you, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th day of the first month. That's, that's historical. Now, we, we celebrate it as Palm Sunday, but in actual fact, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a Saturday. But, but Saturday evening moving into Sunday is no big deal. So I don't have a problem with the Palm Sunday because it would have been close to the ending of, of, of the Saturday, going into the Sunday. So we, we say that well, it was Sunday. But if, but if you count the, the 14th day, that the lamb was supposed to be kept. Saturday would have been the 10th day. Sunday, which we call Palm Sunday, would be the 11th day. Monday would have been the 12th day. Tuesday would have been the 13th day. And Wednesday would have been the 14th day. That's the day that the lamb was to be killed. That was the day that Jesus was crucified. The following day, the Thursday, which begins the, feast, the first day of the Feast of All Never Bread, the word instructed was to be a Sabbath. There was to be no survey work. That's the Sabbath day that came before the day Jesus was crucified. The misinterpretation was that the day before the crucifixion was the Saturday Sabbath. 
No, it wasn't. It was the past over Sabbath. And that's where the mistake was made. So I, again, I'm not saying that it, 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 it is a, is a pagan practice to have celebrated the, um, the crucifixion of Christ on a Friday that we call Good Friday. It is just a, an error in interpretation. So then Jesus would have been in the grave three days and three nights. Thursday night and Thursday morning. Friday night and Friday daytime. Saturday night and Saturday daytime. And by the ending of the Sabbath on Saturday, Jesus would have come out of the grave because if he go into the Sunday night, he would have been going for four nights. And he said he would have been in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. So the women went to the tomb the Sunday morning and the angel told the women he is not here and he's risen. He rose at the ending of that Sabbath. But because the women went to the tomb early Sunday morning, we have associated the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the Sunday morning again. No big deal. Because ending the Sabbath Saturday and beginning the Sunday morning is close. And that's when the news would have been given. So that's when the Christians would have accepted the resurrection of Christ on the Sunday and started to worship on the Sunday. But in terms of precision, timing, and God is precise with timing. Jesus entered Jerusalem on the Saturday evening. He rose from the grave on the Saturday evening, completed exactly three days and three nights in the, in, the, in the belly of the earth, as he indicated. But we say that we will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the Sunday because that's when we got the news. That's when the revelation was heralded. That's when Mary went back and, and, and the, the women who went to the tomb and, and gave the news. So no problem with that. What I say to people, we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ and not Easter. So that's what we have to make clear. And, and we explain to people, avoid the pagan traditions that are associated with the season. Because God tells us, do not practice the traditions that the pagans practice because they are abomination me. So when Richard asks about family having a meal together, no problem with that because there's nothing pagan of that. And there are things that we can do at that time that are not pagan. The issue here is that the 25th of December is a pagan day and we should not honor it. We should treat it differently and do not associate it with the birth of Christ because that's the putting the Ark of the Covenant in the Temple of Dagon. Don't to me, I used to celebrate Christmas and have all these things in specifically in December, but I have changed that because I've had a clear understanding of the word and what the expectation would be. So I, I view the 25th of December completely different. That's my position on it. All right, Rev. Um, all right. Pa Pastor Another John, question again? Yeah, Pastor Carton seemed to be bringing some clarity. Um, so... So, Pastor Carter, yes. um, I'm not sure if you want to shed some light on the questions you asked or you have some other things to say. But um, you like to hear me clearly? Yeah. Speak yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, when you read the word possible and impossible, it doesn't really matter. Um, what I want us to understand is that there are some things that don't really matter to our salvation one way or the other. All right? Now, I understand what Reverend Jackman is covering, and I must concede that I agree with much of what Reverend Jackman is saying. But I want us to, I want us to think about what the question that was raised. Um, is it that the celebration of Christmas is more important to us than what the scripture says that we should do? And as we come to a point in our evolution as Christians and our understanding as Christians, it has been pointed out to you that the traditions that we have celebrated came out of Roman Catholicism and have passed through the different that the the um the early church father, but the one I say early church father, but like come down to protestation and later come down to the um the Reformation, the Ziggly and those guys. But those traditions have remained with the church. As we now arrive at a point in our Christian experience, we've learned that those traditions are not what 
those traditions be celebrated are not traditions that we ought to be celebrating. Do we have a difficulty in accepting that? That's the, that's the question I'm asking. And, and if, if we accept that those are not things that we ought to be practicing, um, do we lose our salvation because we give them up? Uh, do we become less a Christian because we no longer celebrate them? Because here's the thing. When Reverend Reverend Jackman is talking about the, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and, and we keep continuing to go back to the tradition that he's pointed out that ought not to be traditions to the, the church. There's not God in all of his programs. Move his church along to better things as he does. It does not God always use people or uh, use I go to say people to bring even greater clarity to our understanding. Does he not ignite fires in people so that his church can advance a place where the church comes a place where there's a full spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing? Is that not the process for which God works? And is it any less because it's better Eddie? You see, my, ch my challenge here is this. If we hear what the word of God says, and what we are doing is contrary, or what we are doing does not give fullness of glory to God by what we are practicing, are we not to be ready to make the adjustment, the necessary adjustment, as believers, to the glory and honor of God, so that God is going in everything that we do? Or do we fall to the little forces that spoil the vine? Only to find out that and as much as we could have given God more, we chose not to, and, and, and it's a choice, we chose not to, because we would rather hold on to traditions that we have that have been handed down to us, whether those traditions are wrong or right. I don't think that we should hold to the different two traditions simply because they're traditions that have been handed down. And I think that when we come to a place in our question experience, there comes a time when we must ask the hard questions and we need to accept the answers that the hard questions bring to us. Now, are we, are, are we to be, are we to have full discussion? Yes, 100%. I, I, I agree with that. All right? But let us have, let us have discussion on what the word of God says, rather than what traditions have been passed down to us that we cannot prove going to be substantial enough for our Christianity to really matter. Because I don't see any Christian losing his or her Christianity if he fails or, or, or neglects to celebrate Christmas. I understand that the word of God says that Jesus Christ commands us to break bread. But as you go back to the early church, the early, the early church broke bread almost every single day. That's a tradition that we all practice. And so we've come to a place where we, 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 we stuck so, so hard in another tradition is that we only celebrate the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of every given month. Now, that's not what the Bible says it, you know. I don't even qualify it by saying, as off as you drink it. But if you think every month, once a month, is off, though, then you go off. But you don't pray like that, do you? And you pray often. So I, I, I'm just saying that the very, of, very often we, we come up to challenges like the one we are facing now. And we get all wrapped up in what we have had and not sometimes recognizing that what we have can sometimes prove to be a hindrance to what we can get. And a lot of it is because we are comfortable where we are. And we don't want to, we don't want to take the opportunity to prove the word of God, nor do we want to step out in faith because we'll be upsetting the apple cart. But I say this to us as a believer. At some point in all of our lives, God will upset our apple cart. Such is his word. There's no comment. All right, Rev, just before you... Thanks, Pastor Carton. Just before you respond, Rev, um, somebody is saying, so you can probably link everything together, can the time yeah. frame of the birth and death of Christ be categorized down to the, to the specific months of the year? Can the time frame of the birth and death of Christ be categorized down to the specific months of the year. Yes, the answer to that is yes, because because if 
if, if we go back to the establishment of the tr tradition, as I, as I say, that was not a mere tradition that God established with the Jews in Exodus chapter 12. It was, it was a shadow of, of greater light that was to come in the life of Christ. And a lot of the tradition, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Week, a lot of those things have their connection. Even the way the, the, the temple was, was established in the tabernacle and all of those had a specific connection. A lot of the traditions of, 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 of the Jews were, were, not, were not just empty dry rituals. There were things that God had, had given them as a shadow of what was to come. Even, even the Sabbath. I, I remember when we preached a sermon on no more shadows. They commended him for that. Even the, the whole concept of the, of the Sabbath was a shadow of, of a greater rest to come in, in, in Jesus. So it was specific. The first month of the year on the 10th day. The first month of the year in the Jewish calendar was Abid, which we refer to as Nisan, which is, I'd say, the Babylonian name. That was to correspond to our March, April period, roughly in, in that time. So it means then, that's why we, we tend to find that the, the death of Christ comes within that period of time because the Passover period would have coincided with that specific time. And they indicated the only reason why we get the adjustments to, 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 the, to the resurrection day of Christ moving is because it was connected to a pagan culture of this first Sunday after the first full moon, after the equinox. That was a pagan culture which came down into Rome, which was established. So, so, so the, the, the Passover would have been a fixed time period. So yes, you can know the month that Jesus would have been crucified. In terms of his birth, if you read Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 tells you about the course of Abijah, which Zechariah the prophet would have been serving. There were specific courses identified for the priests, and they were served at different times in the temple. And there's a link between the time that, that Zechariah was serving in the temple, that Elizabeth, after he completed his course, got pregnant. And then you can calculate the time that Mary came to her and indicated that she was pregnant. Because you will know when um, Zachariah's course will have finished. There's actually a specific month that you can actually work out when that course will have been finished in the Jewish tradition. And then you will calculate when Mary conceived. And, and as I said, indicating that the, the baby would have been carried a full nine months term. You will arrive at when the birth of Jesus was in, a term, in the term of the month. You will not have a specific date because it was not that precise, but you will have a time of the month. And they say, we, we can't go through the details of that now because if I were to go through that, I would have to go back to specific references, go back to the courses, the time period of the courses, when um, Zachary served his course, when it ended, when Elizabeth was brought in news that she was, was pregnant with John the Baptist, and when Mary came to her and, 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 and gave her news, and work out the calculations, all of that, but yes, but it is far from December. Some people argue because there might be differences in, in the time as to whether it's April or October. But again, we, we can actually get the once we get the, the, the course of, of the Bible work out correctly, we can know when that happened. It's just like Daniel. Daniel indicated where Christ was going to be born, when he was going to come into the world. He gave a specific time period. And when we look at the kingdom of God, we will look at, at Daniel chapter 9 because he predicted the time that Jesus was going to be born. And so we have an idea of, of, of that time. The Jews missed it because they missed the scripture and they missed the time that was fulfilled. But we will see when we come to look at, at, the, at the, the, the kingdom passages. Jesus said in Matthew, in Mark chapter 1 verse 14, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What time? What time is fulfilled? The time that was prophesied. So yes, they're specific. Now, in relation to what John said, that's an important contribution. We have to ask ourselves, 
Are we so connected to these things that we can't separate ourselves from them? So if we argue, that they, well, they're not so important. It's just customs and, and they're just traditions and why we can't do so, why we can't do that. Then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the big deal about separate, separating yourself from them if you get a, a different link on them? It can't be that important. They're not that significant for your salvation. So, so why allow them to have a hold on you that you feel you can't separate yourself from them? You have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is the rationale for? How does it connect me intimately to God? And if I recognize that there's paganism to some things that I am doing, where can I pull myself away from them to please God when I know that God has warned me about getting myself connected to pagan tradition? That is the moral of the story. That is the principle behind it all. And as Christians, we have to allow or, or to prevent ourselves from being trapped, Paul says, by the traditions of the world and and not after God. We have to be careful of that, as he mentioned in Colossians. And he says, I beseech you the mercy of God, we present a body living sacrifice food and set no God, which is a reason so and be not conform to this world. No matter how many people in the world are observing these things, be not conform. A lot of the people in focus on Jesus, his 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 birth and his resurrection, they are carried away in the customs. That's why so much money is spent on alcohol, so much money is spent on Christmas trees. In 2020, the, the Americans spent $1 billion on Christmas trees. And in Britain in 2019, it was estimated that, that people were spending about 3.5 million pounds in alcohol a week in the Christmas season. So we have to watch what really is the focus around these celebrations and don't get caught in the snare and believe that we are honoring Christ by being ensnared into these things. We have to be able to separate ourselves from them if worshiping God according to his standard is, is more important than our own feelings of the things. And that, that is a critical issue. And that's a significant point that, that um, Pastor Carrington would have been thinking. And I support that 100%. If we can't, it means that they have a tie on us. They have a hold on us. And why? Why do they have such a hold on us, seeing that they're not so significant to our salvation? What we do with Christ, how we respond to his death and his resurrection, that is a critical issue. And that's what matters most. And that's what Christians will preach in season and out of season. Uh, Rev, uh, yes. uh, Pastor John's hand is still up, so I'm not sure if um, he has another comment or or if it was up from be from before. Pastor John? No further comment, but um, my apologies. I just neglected to take it down. I forgot to take it down already. So Okay, no problem. No problem. But but Rev, um yes. I am I I am wondering, um Yes. The, you you know this the, 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 the track that we are on, let me use that. Uh, the track that we are on is a track that the witnesses would go on uh, in terms of birthday and in terms of the Easter and, and so on. Uh, yes. So, so can we say that that what probably would have caused persons not to um, lean toward questioning what we do was simply because of how the witnesses, I, I just use them as they're the group that yeah, are really yeah, spoken yeah. when it comes to that. So we, we yes, probably yes. wanted to distance ourselves from them. Maybe that has helped to influence our position. Just just asking, uh, you know. No, that 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 is that is a good question. You see, and, and very often we we tend to view things in relation to other people's perspective on them rather than as what um, Pastor John said, looking at what the word says and what is our position based on the word, is that there are times when I would have talked to, to some of my Christian brothers from the Nazarene and from the um, from other from other denominations, and they, they they told me that our doctrine is Adventist doctrine. In other words, our belief in, in, in certain things in relation to our millennialism and our, our belief in relation to how we view certain things in Revelation, 
in Adventist um, doctrine. I, I said, no, no. All you say is that the Adventists might interpret it in the way we interpret it, but don't tell me that this is the Adventist doctrine because the Adventists don't have any hold on what the word says. So it's just that they interpret it. So we, we sometimes look at you and say, well, oh, that's a cult. So therefore, they have an issue with birthdays. They have an issue with celebrating Christmas. They have an issue with celebrating um, Easter or those things. So if I go down that track, I, I, I might be aligning myself with Jehovah's Witnesses, beliefs, and traditions. No, you, don't, you can't look at it like that. The, the, the reality is, is that some people that we might identify as cults can have a true perspective on some of the issues that, that we might, might be overlooking. And that's the reality. It's the first person that drew my attention to looking at the, the actual time that Jesus was crucified it was Herbert W. Armstrong. He was the first person that I, I, I heard with the position that Jesus must have been crucified a different day from Friday. That was, a, that was a misinterpretation between the Sabbath that people were looking at. I began to look at some other uh, Bible uh, scholars, evangelical scholars now, because people will say, well, that that, that sort of um, belief system with the, the world tomorrow is, is, is not you know, what we would be inclined to want to follow and accept. But the reality is, is that he had a perspective on it that I found then that a lot of theologians in the evangelical group were supporting. And I began to do my own personal studies on it, right over the Gospels, three, four times, getting all the details, stressing that whole week that we refer to as the Holy Week in Jesus' life to get the, the accurate account. But I was motivated by somebody that we would consider, but maybe that is, 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 is not the best practice in terms of religious beliefs. So we have to be careful of, of, of that, that based, based in our position, based on position that other people might have, we will have to look at them and see if they have truth in them. Now, I would dismiss a lot of the other thing that the U.S. is teach. But that does not mean that they may not have the right perspective on, on that. There's a lot of paganism associated with what we do at Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be careful that we don't judge things based on other people's interpretation, that we check the word for ourselves and we establish our position based on instructions that, that, that God has given to us from his word the things that he has established and the light that we get from the word of God. When we get light, don't ignore it and try to justify it by what we might call a good rationale. That's why it took time to point out to you that God does not work on a good rationale. And that's why Saul got punished, even though he might have said that the sheep being offered to God was a good thing. They were offering them as a sacrifice. No God not said that because God gave a different instruction. And we have to obey God's instruction. In other words, there's no good reason to disobey God. Absolutely none. Don't care how we rationalize it, how we justify it, how we can satisfy our own thought pattern and emotion and feeling about things. There can be no good reason to disobey God. So don't try to justify anything that God speaks against. So we, we need to study the word and see what God speaks against and what God upholds. All right, Rev. So and we have Rev. Meeks coming in now with a comment or question. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Good night. Um, Good night. Normally, yes, please. We normally say that Christ is the reason for the season. And and, and for some reason, you cannot find a lot of Christian people at church in December. That's right. Right? No, he's supposed to be the reason for the season, but you can't find people at church. They're somewhere, looking through some window or something. Right? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing that we had in Trinidad when it was a Bible school. You call it Carnival Camp. No, it wasn't about Carnival, but in the time of carnival, the church will have their camps to take away the, the Christians away from um, the partying and that kind of stuff that going on. It was an unfortunate name. It's called Carnival Camp, but it has nothing to do with carnival. It is just about um, 
teaching people the things of God during that same time of reverie and stuff. Now, the question I want to ask you, Pastor, is what, what do you see as a best practice for December 25th or that whole season? We, 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 we may not observe it as the Lord's Day, but is this something that we can do or what is the best way you think that we can approach if we have services, uh, how to have them, if we so-called have, as a brother was saying earlier, a time where we fellowship with our family, how to do it. What is the best practice you would think for that time? I, I, I would find it difficult to, 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 to um, answer that in terms of what is the, is the best practice. Be, be, because I would then be trying to determine what people should do around that time of the year. I, I don't know if I can say what people should do. What I was trying to argue is that what we should not do based on the instruction that we have been given from the word of God, what we should not do, things that are definitely connected to paganism that we should not get involved in. I can, I can say that um, based on the word. It'd be difficult for me to say um, what it should, what would be a best practice. Now, the, the reality is that we, we have an established tradition. Traditions are hard to break. It is global. Easter is global. Christmas is global. They came into Christian practice as a result of the influence of a, of a pagan emperor who had claimed that he had accepted Christ and he was following Christianity. The reality is that Constantine was still pagan. Uh, he was trying to merge the pagan practice with Christian practice. And, and as a result, we got, we got trapped in that dilemma and that Christian ended up still practicing some of the pagan things. They did not pull themselves from it and establish what was, was, was going on. Now, in relation to what you talked about, the example with the carnival time, okay, they made a decision of, as to what they would do around that time. They didn't have a specific instruction given to them as to not to practice certain things. Now, the idea of the carnival, they, the, you can have issues with that when you look at what the carnival represented. But what, what they were looking at is what they, they could do on that day. It is like the, it is like the Christians going, going into a band and going down on Spring Garden on the Dumont Day and say, well, this is a war, holy band. What you are engaging? You are engaging in an activity that is considered a reveling. And the Bible says we should avoid reveling. And I believe that's how we should view that. But what we, what we would say is, well, hey, I am going into this reveling for a good reason because I just want to establish um, myself as a Christian and that we can still be involved in a culture in a decent way. Rather than saying, no, what, what, what is the whole focus and what is the whole spirit that is involved in that, I don't want to be associated with it because I do not think it is really, in essence, honoring God. So we just defend. So, so, so yes, people can do things around the see Now, we are still going to sing carols. As, as I say to my folk, no, we are not celebrating Christmas. Even if we are celebrating, we are celebrating the advent or the coming of Christ in the world. If, if the children are going to recite, let them recite things that speak about Christ, not about Christmas. Because the emphasis is not on the festival. If the emphasis is on Christ, let's deal with Christ. If we do things that are associated with Christ, because we have been accustomed around that time to be focusing on those things, as I said, I, I can't determine what is the best practice. I, I can only speak against what, what might be considered as pagan. But what I'm saying is that we have to watch the attention and the focus and the, and the, the, the way we, we, we highlight and elevate the 25th of December because that day is connected with paganism and it has nothing to do and we can't connect that day in any way to Christ. If you want to connect things that we do in honor of Christ, saying our carols and, 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 and doing things of that nature, fine. If we want to give gifts in, in terms of, we say, recognizing that, 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 that um, Jesus, gifts were brought to Jesus, and we want to give gifts, well, that might be 
what we might consider as as wholesome. But 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 the reality is that that was still connected to something that was a practice of of the pagan festival of Saturnalia. It had nothing to do with giving gifts to Jesus because Jesus was not even born yet. You see, so so we have to understand all of that. So we have to determine what we are doing and what is connected to and if it is comfortable with the spirit of what God will want us and determine that. So that is how you can answer that. But I know for sure what things we need to keep away from because they are specifically addressed and they are connected to paganism and those are what we are avoid. So Rev, com yes. coming, from the, coming from the chat now, um, Sandra Pollard Bostic is saying, we should stop putting decorated Christmas trees inside our churches. That's that's coming from um, <laughs> um, Sandra Pollard Bostic. And then Edie's, um, I'm not sure if this is a person or a group, but it's from Edie's and they're saying, history has shown us time and time again that human beings are opposed to change. So no armed with the convicting knowledge of the word of God, shouldn't we now as Christians set an example to break tradition and follow Christ as, we, as he would want us to? The eyes of the world are on us. When we were babes in Christ, we behave as babe in, babes in Christ. Now we are being fed meat and no longer milk for our souls. We should put away childish things. And they're basing that on 1 Corinthians 3.11, based on what they have here, yeah? Um, so those are just two comments. And, and, yes. and, and Pastor and, John and, is saying and, amen and, to it all. <laughs> yes, those, those comments are, are well said. They are justified and they're quite appropriate. As I said, we have to ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? So you decorate your Christmas tree, you put it inside your house or inside your church, and, and the Bible indicated in Jeremiah, these people are practicing paganism. They're cutting down the trees from, from the forest. They're decorating them with silver and gold, and they're fastening them in their homes. Remember, as I told you, that tradition came from Babylon. Now, is it true that Tammuz blood dropped on a dead pine tree and it came back to life? No. That's a legend. It could not have happened. But that's what the people were taught and they believe it. The father of lies. Remember, Satan is behind all paganism. Remember, I told you from Revelation, the war in heaven is not a war with spears and swords and missiles and guns. The angels didn't fight that way. It was a war of worship. The devil wanted worship. And he and he he he, he gave instruction to one third of the angel was who would have followed his instruction and disobeyed the fact that worship is only due to God and God alone, and they were cast out of heaven with the devil. The devil has come down to earth and he wants the worship that he did not get, and he's putting mankind in some pagan practices and idolatrous practices which will give him worship. A lot of the symbolism, the, the rituals, and the paganism which Satan has infused in people's cultures and belief practices is really to get worship. So we've got to watch that when we are doing these things, honoring paganism, we are giving the devil the worship that he wants and not thinking about that. So you have to reflect on that. So we will say, well, oh, the lights on the Christmas tree represent just the light of the world. So I put some lights on the Christmas tree, and that's a good reason, rationale, wrong. We are the light of the world. Jesus said that we are the light. He is the true light, giving us that light. We shine and we represent Christ with our light, not with lights on the Christmas tree or lights all over the place. That's a custom and a tradition. And I'm saying that if we are going to have the best practice, I, why, why am I going to put a Christmas tree in the church and decorate it with all these and 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 and, and all these things, the holy, the mistletoe, you love, and all of those things are pagan symbols all associated with Christmas, even the colors and what they represent, Santa, and, 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 and all those things are way there. Those things go right back to the world. And, and, and we get caught up in these things, we teach them to our children, we put up the stocking and tell the children Santa is going to drop gifts. No, no, I don't know if Christians are still doing those things, but the re reality is is that we need to watch all of those things and see who we are giving worship to. No, Santa is a, is a 
you got a bigger icon in the lives of a lot of children at this time, at, at that season of the year, than Christ. And mm -hmm. as Brother Weeks rightfully say, our own Christmas time, we find that the church numbers say they not reduced because people caught up in, in the cleaning up and the decoration and the buying curtains and doing all sorts of things and they come in the church. Why? Why are you doing that? What's the rationale behind it? You are giving glory and honor to God and, and your attendance is reduced as a result of the whole celebration. No, we got we got to watch those things and as we say, we have to be light to the world and not let the world squeeze us into its mold. So those comments were were well said. Now we have exhausted the, 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 the night, but I think it was it was it was a good night because we got people to talk, express their feelings. The kingdom of God, we can pick that up from the next session. Of course, they said we got all October. I am with you for the long haul. Maybe we get into November. That's where I am going with you because I want us to get an understanding of truth and and talk perspective on things and break some of the traditions that that have a hold on us that really should not have a hold on us because we we ought to be putting God's perspective first and not the traditions of men or our own feelings and emotions on things. So those last two comments were very appropriate and I, I appreciate those comments.